length of a rectangle is decreased by 30% and the width is increased by 15%, the area of the resulting rectangle is smaller than the area of the original rectangle by what percent? Okay, so this one's pretty easy because we know the length of the rectangle decreased by 30%, so that can be represented as uh, 0.7 multiplied by that length, let's just call it L. And then to find the area, so we're going to multiply this whole thing by the width. The width was increased by 15%, so this is just multiplied by 1.15, and that's going to be our width. And we do some math here, 0 0.7 times 1.15 is going to give us a value of 0 0.805 of our length times width, or our area. Okay, so it wants... Uh, is smaller than the area of the original rectangle by what percent? So it's not 80.5 percent because in fact to find that value we would have to subtract 0.805 or I guess you want to express this as a decimal away from 1, 1 representing 100 percent. That would give us 0.195 or 19.5 percent giving us B as our final answer. All right, so this ACT math problem says, in the standard XY coordinate plane below, the endpoints of the major and minor axes of the ellipse are labeled, which of the equations determines the ellipse? Okay, so we see our answer choices. Let's cross off D and E because those both represent standard forms for a circle, and we're dealing with an ellipse here. Um, we can see that it is a vertical ellipse based on the graph because it is more tall than it is wide. That doesn't really help us answer the question because we see here that the B value, remember in the standard form here, we know that there is, the center is at the origin of 0, 0, and so you're not going to write the form as x minus h. I mean, you could, but here we can just simplify it down to x squared over a squared plus y squared over b squared equals 1. Okay, so we know that our B value here our b value here, or our b squared value, is going to be greater than a uh, because it is taller than it is wide. That's how we know it is a vertical ellipse. If we do take the square root of b, so then we get our b value, what does this b value tell us? Well, it is very helpful for finding the actual coordinates of the vertices, right? So if we have our uh, hk representing our center here at the origin, um, what you can write at this as is h comma k, and then to find the coordinates of those vertices, you're going to do plus minus b, okay? If you were to find the co-vertices on the x-axis, you just do h plus minus a comma k. Okay, so now that we have this form, it's super easy because we know what our h value is going to be. Our h value, as you can see on the y-axis, is always 0. So we can write this as 0. And then we know our k value is still 0 and then plus minus the b value. Well, what is the b value? Well, we can just see from our origin down here, we can see the y value changed by seven units downwards, and then the same thing for this side, it increased by seven units, and so we can confidently say that the b value is seven. And we know in our standard form, the b value is squared on under that uh, y squared, and so seven squared is 49, and so the only equation here that has a b squared value of 49 is option c and so that is our correct answer Let a b c and d be real numbers given that a b equals 100 a d equals 0 and a b c equals d which of the following must be true okay a says a equals 0 or b equals 0. well we can see here that a b is equivalent to 100 and so if either a or b was 0 you get a final product of 0 instead of 100 so it can't be a uh, b says both a and b are 1 well a a times b is given as 100, 1 times 1 is 1, those two aren't equal, so it can't be b. Uh, c says a is equivalent to negative b. Well, again, we can see we get a positive value when we multiply a and b. Uh, if c were true, we'd get a negative value instead of positive 100 in our case. All right, d says c equals 0. So this one's really interesting because we already know that uh, we have these other expressions and so we can match it up and see if it's true, right? Because a times b equals 100, okay? So we know that here, a times b must be equal to 100. So 100c equals d. And then we can actually use the second expression, a times d equals 0. Okay, so a times z, or a times d equals 0. We already know that a cannot be 0, right? So therefore, we know that d must be 0 because a times z equals 0. So how does D become zero? 
Well, we know that a times b is 100. So the only way for d to become 0 when uh, a, b is multiplied by c is for c to be equal to 0, and therefore d is our correct answer. Since Josephine plays a game where she rolls the six-sided dice and gets points for each corresponding outcome, a roll of 1 results in 1 point, and so on. What is the expected number of points she should have after 90 rolls of the dice? If you take AP stat, this one should be pretty easy. This is what we call a discrete random variable. Uh, basically, we have a six-sided dice, right? So to find the expected value per roll, what you would do is multiply the probability of each event or each getting it each side, because this is a fair dice, we're going to assume the probability of, say, rolling a one is one-sixth, uh, rolling a two is one-sixth, and so on, right? And then you would multiply that probability by each of the values. So if I roll the one, that'd be one point and so on. Now there is an easier way to do this instead of doing that manual calculation. I mean, you're not gonna skip it entirely, but it is basically to add up all of the possible values. So six plus five plus four plus three, I'm just gonna manually write this out, plus two plus one because it's not that crazy of a calculation. So there we have 11, 15, 18, 20, 21. And so we have 21 values here and we're going to divide it by the number of occurrences or six-sided dice, divide by six. And you'll notice this is the exact same thing as if we multiplied everything by one-sixth and then added everything together at the end. So if we have 21 divided by six, will give us a value of 3.5. This value of 3.5 is our expected number of points per roll. Therefore, if we roll the dice 90 times, we just have to multiply this number by a value of 90. And 90 times 3.5 is a value of 315, and therefore B is our answer. Figure below, B, C, and E, F are parallel, and A, E is congruent to F, D. If angle A, B, C is 130 degrees, and B, A, F is 22 degrees, what is the measure of A, E, F? Okay, so this angle right here that we're trying to find. What we're going to do is draw a line, a straight line from A to D. Okay, so imagine that's a straight line. So why did I just do that? Okay, because we know from E to F, that is parallel with BC. So from drawing a point from A to D, we also just created another parallel line. And it's interesting because you see AE, right? That is basically a transversal that cuts in between these two parallel lines of EF and AD. Now, why is that important? Well, because we know that it's going to create two angles, right? These two angles right here, what do they mean? Well, these are same side interior angles, okay? So if I have two parallel lines, let's draw this out here, and then I have a transversal, no matter how I put this transversal, the interior angles here, right, these two that I label right here, they're gonna add up to 180 degrees, right? So I can draw like this, that's still 180 degrees, okay? It would be something like that. Okay, so let me erase this. So what we have now is we can also create another set of parallel lines. We're honestly not even creating those lines, but just pointing them out. And that is going to be B to C, okay? Because watch this. We have A to D and B to C. Since we know A to D is parallel with E to F, E to F is parallel with B to C. And so B to C should be parallel with A to D. And this line right here, AB, guess what? That's another transversal, okay? And we have another set of interior angles right here angle bad which we're trying to solve for because that'd be very useful to find the angle of ead and then we also have this set of angles right here of cba and so we know that our first set of interior angles they have to add up 280 degrees if we have 180 degrees we're going to subtract 130 degrees oops 130 degrees that's going to give us 50 degrees okay so what does this 50 degrees mean? Well, this means this right here, our angle BAD has to be 50 degrees. So let's get rid of that. So we have 50 degrees. And then we know originally that our angle of BAF is 22 degrees. So we can subtract 22 degrees away. And so that is going to leave us with 28 degrees. And this 28 degrees right here is our angle EAD. Okay, so let me label that EAD. Cool. Now, what do we do? Well, we have another set of interior angles we have to find, and now it's a pretty easy problem, right? Because we know that this angle right here, boom, and this angle that we just found of 28 degrees, they have to add up to 180 degrees, like we said before. So 180 minus 28, what is that in degrees? Well, that's 152 degrees as our final answer. So guys, if you want to see more ACT math problems, make sure you subscribe, and I'll see you guys in the next one.